Today is February 11, 2019. We are, the, we are at the Glen Arden Library in Glen Arden, Maryland with Mr. Lawrence Winston, resident of Glen Arden, Maryland. We are here to conduct an oral history for the Sojourner Truth Room African American Research Speak Your Truth Oral History Project. My name is Misty Trinnell, the uh, librarian for the Sojourner Truth Room. Good afternoon. Well, good evening, Mr. Winston. Good evening. Thank you for joining me today. We'll start off with some biographical information. Can you give me your full name, please? Yes, Lawrence Dunbar Winston, Sr. Okay. And when and where were you born? Born in Washington, D.C., Freedman's Hospital. Okay. What year? 1643. 1943. And where did you grow up? Um, up to seven years old in Washington, D.C., and from 1950 on, when my father built a house in Glen Arden, from there until it was 1962. Okay. So did you live somewhere else uh, after 1962? 62, I went in the military and uh, was there for four years and um, was married and came back to Glen Arden, um, I guess about 20 years ago. Okay. And... Um, after military, what other career industry um, did you work in? Okay, when I left the military, I um, worked for a car rental, left there, and went to the Smithsonian Institution, the Science Information Exchange. Uh, from there, I went to um, Metropolitan Life Insurance Company as a salesperson and then as a manager there. Left there and went to um, Prince George's County Department of Corrections and worked there for 18 years and retired there. Oh, okay. Do you have um, any siblings and children that are in the area or moved from the area? Uh, yes, all four of my children are still in the area. Um, Kevin, uh, Sheila, Lawrence Jr. and Janine. Okay. My children. And they're still in the area. All right. And they all grew up in Glen Arden also, or? No, I was the only one that grew up in Glen Arden myself and my wife at the time. Both of us grew up in, in Glen Arden. Um, we married and moved out to D.C. and then um, to the Oxon Hill area. Um, so our children were born in those locations. Okay. Okay. Siblings? Do you have any siblings? Um, I'm one of six. Um, my sister's the oldest. She's still with us. And um, four brothers. Um, and they are, I was about to say, Sonny Marshall, Lance, Gillian, Raymond. But Sonny was his nickname. Uh, Matthew was his, um, his real name. Uh, Matthew, Robert, um, myself, and Raymond. Okay. okay, so from there we'll talk about, I'll ask you some questions about the uh, the town of Glen Arden. I'm familiar with you some, and I know that you have a lot of um, historical information about the town, so I'll ask you the following questions will be about um, the town of Glen Arden. So can you uh, tell us about um, Glen Arden as far as how it was founded and incorporated and information related to how it, the town was started? Okay. It started um, early 1900s. Um, after the Civil War, um, the Freedmen's Bureau tried to assist the slaves the ex-slaves, to find a place for them to assimilate. Um, they left the plantations if they could, and some of them stayed on the plantation and continued to work there um, because they could find nowhere else to uh, have employment. Um, a part of that, because um, Glen Arden is a part of one of the mass plantations, it was the Bowie Plantation, as you may well know. Bowie was um, 
one of the governors of um, the state of Maryland. And when the Europeans came to um, this land, they just took what land they wanted, and much of it, they took land, uh, as far as they could see, they said it belonged to them. Um, so in, in doing that, um, those folks who left the plantation, uh, some of them uh, became sharecroppers on the plantations and on the large farms. Um, those were the African American. But taking back a bit further, um, when the Europeans came here, they took the natives as their slaves on their plantations, but they couldn't keep them because they would run away from the plantations. And the Europeans were not able to determine one um, of the indigenous people from the other. So they decided that they would go to Africa and get the Africans and bring the Africans here as, as slaves. Saying all that to say that when the African slaves ran away from the plantations, the Native Americans um, took them in um, to live on, in their tribes. Saying all that to say when um, we were all freed, blacks and the and the Native Americans were freed. Um, the Native Americans were still not given um, their civil rights, right to vote, etc. So they moved into the black communities. Um, and saying that to say, many of the Native Americans moved in to Glen Arden. Um, and basically, there were three groups of us. Um, the Native Americans, and they call themselves we sort of people because um, they wanted to maintain their um, heritage because the, um, the whites would only allow them rights if they um, could prove that they were Native Americans. So the only way they had any rights was for them to move in the black communities. So. It was way back then that uh, um, Glen Arden basically started. And the um, folks who left the plantations, um, also those folks who were um, sharecroppers, um, they moved in with people that they knew. And that's one large group of um, of Glen Agnes, and like I say, the other group of, were the Native Americans, and the, the other group was those of us who were not related to any um, of those two groups. Um, many of the people came during the um, Great Migration, when many of the blacks left the South and going north, um, many of them going as far as New York and beyond. But some of them who stopped off um, in Prince George's County, in D.C., Prince George's County, etc., um, came to Glen Arden. Uh, Glen Arden basically um, started when this white real estate firm in D.C. named Glen Arden. Um, they purchased land on both sides of the railroad track, the WBNA, the Washington, Baltimore, Annapolis Railway, which ran from DC to Baltimore and branched off going down to Annapolis. Um, so he bought land on both sides of it, um, on one side of it, which was Glen Arden and Glen Arden Heights. And Glen Arden was considered from um, that railroad track to Bright Seed Road and Glenarden Heights was considered an area beyond Bright Sea Road, um, which actually ran, it was by number one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, up to Ninth Street. Um, so that was a part of what um, made Glenarden happen. And the reason that the real estate firm bought that land, they bought the land <coughs> for 
for for blacks. Mm. Um, and they did that because there was a codicil for um, the different communities could not rent or sell to blacks. So this was during World War II when um, when the um, the town of Glen Arden decided that it would build um, the land that was on the other side of uh, the railroad track, which was we call Glen Arden Woods. But uh, much of Glen Arden, before it was incorporated, um, was basically farmland uh, where we had um, domestic animals, chicken, hogs, um, no running water. We had outdoor uh, toilets. Uh, went to the uh, creek or to the well to get water. No sewage, um, kerosene lamps. Um, this was the situation in the black neighborhoods. Um, though we were um, taxpaying citizens, as well as um, serve our time in the military. Like I said, when we left the military, we needed a place to, to buy and or rent uh, to live. So that was a part of, of the reason for Glenard Woods being built because the, the town at the time decided it would, it would um, have a development where um, the returning veterans could uh, decide they wanted to buy and live in a home, a detached home. Um, prior to the detached home, there was a community called Booker T Homes. Those were at attached homes um, that were built for the returning veterans. But the Glenard Woods were, were detached homes. So um, before Glenard was even incorporated, um, the Civic Association, which was a group of the Glen Arden residents, decided that they wanted to show some pride in um, their community. Um, and in doing so, they wanted to be able to um, have the same kind of um, same kind of facilities that the white communities had. And the only way that we found out that we could do that was, was to incorporate and North Brentwood was the first to incorporate. Palmer Heights was the second. Glen Arden was the third. And Eagle Harbor was the fourth. And we decided that, uh, they decided that they would incorporate in order to get the services. Um, one of the things that uh, we and Glen Arden had, before I get to that, um, the first mayor of Glen Arden was uh, Mayor Swan. He was the president of the Glenarden Civic Association at the time. He is the one that um, petitioned the state of Maryland to incorporate, and it happened in 1939 um, for that to happen. So he was the first mayor. Um, mayor Cousins was the second mayor. Um, mayor Swan was also a carpenter by trade, so he built many of the homes in Glenarden as a contractor, um, and Mayor Cousins was um, a policeman. He was a police chief for, um, for Glen Arden at that time. So after Mayor Cousins, after Mayor Swan, after his first term, then they elected Mayor Cousins to, um, to be the mayor. And he was the mayor from that point on until 1969. Mm -hmm. um, during that time, he um, was thought of as the Dean of Mayors by the Maryland Mayors Association. Not the Maryland Black Mayors Association, but the Maryland Mayors Association. So the white mayors in uh, Maryland thought that much of Mayor Cousins um, because of his um, visionary progressiveness which brought us from dirt roads to basically what you see here now in the 2019. Um, brought us from dirt roads and no electricity to um, what you see here now, which includes uh, the Woodmore Town Center area. Um, made Glenarden so inviting that 
um, the first home improvement store, Heckinger. Um, Heckinger was uh, a DC city councilman who built the, uh, the home improvement store there in, in DC. And I guess he and they thought that Glenard was so inviting that they would build uh, a Heckinger right at our border. Um, but a part of our um, inviting atmosphere, as in most communities, we have um, recreation, we have churches, we have businesses, um, all those things uh, we had in Glen Arden uh, during the segregated days. Um, people from all around would come to our facilities, our churches. We had two churches, which was um, St. Joseph's Catholic Church and the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. Um, and the people from, not just from Glen Arden, but surrounding area, and that was during the uh, segregated days, even when the churches were segregated. Um, the Baptist Church, the uh, Catholic Church, St. Joseph's Catholic Church, people from all, all over would come to it um, once it was built. And it was built by the citizens of Glen Arden who were um, members of the, the Catholic Church. Just the same thing with the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden. Uh, Glen Arden um, members of that church built it. And it has become um, a church that has grown so that it has gone through three, two different locations and now it's at its third location. Um, St. Joseph Church outgrew it, um, its building and it had gone to two different locations. It is now located um, right at the um, 704 and um, McCormick. Mm -hmm. um, on this side of 704 is St. Joseph's Drive. Um, but Glen Arden and Glen Ardeners have um, a great reputation of being progressive. Um, all during the time that Mayor Cousins was mayor of Glen Arden, um, there were quite a few people who came to Glen Arden because of our progressiveness and the way that we had grown. Um, One of the first, no, the first black or the Prince George's County Council came under the tutelage of Mayor Cousins in the name of, of uh, Floyd Wilson. Floyd Wilson was a resident of Glen Arden. He was a businessman. Um, he owned the building, second house from, from the corner from uh, uh, the library. and. Like I said, he was a businessman. He became a councilman. Um, and under Mayor Cousins' tutelage and the kind of reputation that Glen Arden has had and the reputation that Mayor Cousins had, he was the first black elected to the Prince George's County Council. Um, the next person that was uh, elected to, well, he was also the first black to be the county council chair. So they elected him to be the chair of the council. The next person to uh, come from Glen Arden to be the council person, councilman is uh, um, James Fletcher. He was a Glen Arden councilman and also a mayor of, of, uh, of Glen Arden. Um, he passed away while in office on the, on the council and replacing him was mm -hmm. uh, Mayor Marvin Wilson. Um, and Wilson, he replaced, it, replaced uh, Fletcher on the council so he was a third black on the council, and he came from Glen Arden as well. Um, so you could see that the Glen Ardeners were looked upon highly um, in terms of people to, um, to represent the county even. Um, so it was that kind of reputation that, that we carry, and we are pretty proud of that reputation. Okay. I'm not sure what more, how else you want to, what other questions you may have. Um, that was helpful because um, some of the things you covered is some of the things that I read as I was trying to get prepared for this interview. And uh, those mayors that you named, I saw their names in an article from like, I think maybe 1980 or so. And it talked about the history of the progression of the um, city, of the town, and how all of those mayors played a part in it. So that was helpful to hear you um, talk about it. Um, 
Another thing that I uh, read as I was preparing, and I, I'm noticing your um, your b baseball cap here, I read about there being um, some uh, very good uh, softball and baseball teams. So can you um, tell me some, some things about those teams? Yes, as I was saying about the fact that uh, most communities has uh, recreation. Uh, well, Glen Arden had its recreational league, and it was basically these... Uh, the citizens of Glen Arden, we formed a, a baseball league. Um, one of the people who um, started the, the baseball league was um, um, Roland Kenner. Roland Kenner, he was also uh, on our police force later, later on. Um, but he was on the baseball team as well as Raymond Smith. Raymond Smith uh, was a barber in Glen Arden. Um, he also happened to be the first black establishment on Martin Luther King Highway. Um, at that time, it was called George Palmer Highway before they changed it to Martin Luther King. And to back up a bit, uh, George Palmer Highway um, was turned into George Palm Highway, which previously was the railroad tracks of the WBNA, the Washington Baltimore Annapolis Railway, that ran from, like I said, from um, um, from DC Union Station up to Baltimore, and then branched off, going down to uh, Annapolis, which is the Washington Baltimore Annapolis Railway. It was electric uh, railway, much like a trolley cars um, had been previously, and had been running through D.C. Hmm. But um, um, that business was the first business, uh, black business, on George Palmer Highway at the, at the time. Raymond Smith was also one of the people who um, ran the baseball team. It was considered the Glen Arden Braves, um, and it was a part of uh, what some may think of as the Negro Baseball League. Um, other than the professionals, which was um, out of um, Griffith Stadium in, in D.C., which is the area that, that uh, we used to live in before we moved to, to Glen Arden, mm. um, which is around the corner from Friedman's Hospital, where I was born. Um, Friedman's Hospital is now Howard University Hospital. Oh, okay. So it's that kind of relationship and that, that kind of growth. But the baseball team, um, Glenard Braves, was a part of the, the Negro League, and the Negro, Negro League was the other black communities in Prince George's County would um, have uh, recreational teams, and they had baseball teams as well, as well as football teams. Um, but uh, one of our rivalries was the, the Vista Yankees, which was a community maybe about maybe 10 miles um, north of Glen Arden. Um, it was in the Glen Arden, it was in the Lincoln Vista area. Um, but they did not have enough um, members of the team, so half of their team were Glen Ardeners. So that was a part of the rivalry between the Vista Yankees and the Glen Arden Braves to see who could beat who more than one time type thing. But we would make our rounds um, to the other black communities, which included um, Brandywine, um, uh, Bowie. Um, Bowie was a black, it was a white community, but the train tracks ran through Bowie. So, as you may well know, on one side of the tracks was a black neighborhood, the other side of the tracks was a white neighborhood. Here's the term on, on, on the other side of the tracks. That's where that came from. Not just from Bowie's situation, but um, the black white relationship uh, here in the United States, period. Um, Brandywine, Vista, um, Wilma's Park was one of the locations in, in Brandywine we would, we would go. Uh, Wilma's Park also was an entertainment center where um, black entertainers who would make their rounds on what was called a chitlin circuit from New York to um, Howard, Howard uh, 
theater in D.C. Um, so they would stop there as they were making their rounds on the Chitlin circuit. So they were entertained there. Um, we would have um, um, recreational activities going on. They would make it a whole day affair, sitting down listening to music, um, playing baseball, and um, having cookouts there as well. So as far as our recreation is concerned, those are the kinds of things that we did as far as baseball. We also had a, a football team as well, and those same parents that um, formed the uh, baseball team were the same parents that formed the football team. And we would play football even before we got to uh, teens. Um, us as youngsters would go on an area we call Swales Diamond. Swales because Swales was the man that owned the property. And it was a big wide open field there. And he would allow us to uh, play um, our recreations there. We would play baseball in that location as well as uh, football. Um, so it's those kinds of things that uh, we were involved in. Uh, the current location of the uh, Teresa Banks Glenard Rec Center is the location where the parents build um, a little recreation area for the stu for uh, the kids, um, yeah, the merry-go-round, uh, basketball court, baseball field, um, a shelter for us to be in under the out of the weather, um, those kinds of um, things for uh, for the youngsters. And like I said, that the, the Maryland Park and Fan Commission now have stewardship of that location, um, carrying on the recreation center as. Um, as our family started there. Okay, great. Okay, so the next thing I want to ask you about is um, changes that have occurred in the county, well, in the town since um, since the um, since Mayor Cousins and all of the other mayors that helped to progress progress the town to what we can see structurally today. What kind of changes? Um, have occurred since their administrations. We are moving very slowly now in terms of any progress. Um, we faced quite a few issues. Um, as a part of Mayor Cousins' progressiveness, many of the county initiatives um, were as a result of some of the sayings that, uh, that Mayor Cousins um, came up with in order to um, for us to grow. And I, I can't think of any of the other um, people who were who allowed us to, to move forward um, in a rather progressive way. Um, some of the other people who came out of the town of Glen Arden was um, Tommy Broadwater. Tommy Broadwater um, was a businessman and he moved to Glen Arden from Fremont Heights, Fremont Heights area. Um, in my talking with him, who happened to be my classmate at, in school, Fremont Heights High School, he indicated that um, he moved to Glen Arden because of his Glen Arden progressiveness. So Fremont Heights might want to own him in one way, but we own him in the other way in terms of how he has progressed since being uh, he became a council person in Glen Arden. Um, and he said that Mayor Cousins talked him into running for the position of senator, which is the reason that he ran for senator. He was became Senator Broadwater. Hmm. Um, after Senator Broadwater, um, Decatur Trotter, who was also a city mayor, he became um, the next senator, taking Senator Broadwater's place. Um, so as you can see, we have a far-reaching 
um, tentacles. So we were not just in the county, we reached into the state as well. Um, and beyond the state, we have Albert Wynn, who was a congressman, he was a delegate, a senator, and now he became uh, the first black congressman to represent Prince George's County. Hmm. So we have all these people who came out of Glen Arden to represent Prince George's County. Um, and that was during the time that it was considered the town of Glen Arden. Well, when the, when Mayor um, Don Juan Williams became mayor, he decided that our population had grown to such an extent that it would moved from being a town to be a city because there's an uh, increase in population. So we became uh, the city of Glen Arden. But during that growth and development, I was telling you about uh, Heckinger um, moving to the outskirts of Glen Arden. Well, another um, invitee was Landover Mall, just on our border, where um, Heck Company, um, Sears and Roebuck, Lord and Taylor, Garfinkel's, all these high-end stores decided they wanted to come there. So that's another indication of how inviting Glenard was and continues to be. Um, another part of our most recent development is um, Woodmore Town Center at Glenard. Um, and one of the big chains that came there was Wegmans. There's not that many high-end Wegmans anywhere in the country, but they decided that they want to come to Glen Arden, which is another indication as how inviting uh, our community is. One of the things that um, we're kind of proud of, and that is there's a saying that we kind of go by, and that is we live by a commitment to the community, and it's a family-friendly uh, community that was a nurturing community, and we're trying not to lose that. Though we are growing, um, we want to continue to be um, uh, a nurturing community. One of the ways that we decided that we wanted to um, um, prolong that commitment to the community, many of the founding families in Glen Arden um, established an organization called the Glen Arden Pioneers. And we decided we wanted to um, get together once a year every year, uh, no matter where we may have, some of them may have moved to, they would always come back to the Glenard Pioneers reunion. And it was much like a family reunion, and it is much like a family reunion, um, because we are considered ourselves a large, nurturing, family-friendly community. So we uh, established the, the, the group called the Glenard Pioneers, and we get together every year for, um, for just that purpose to show folks that we are still family friendly and have that kind of relationship with one another. Um, That's great. That's great. Um, we'll start to wrap up here, but I also wanted to ask you about, because um, as you were giving us a history, you were talking about the other incorporated towns. So I'm, I'm just personally curious, like what's the interaction like between, um, you know, people from Glen Arden and, North Brentwood or, or Fairmont Heights? Um, is there, um, considering, you know, uh, school segregation and things, like, was there an opportunity for you all to uh, interact and meet and, and get to know each other, um, even though, you know, you were in separate incorporated towns? That's, that, that's very good, <clears throat> which is an indication, basically, as to how we as Glen Ardeners were looked upon as well, because of the way that we has grown have grown just even compared with the other three historically black communities. We're still the most progressive of the four, um, and we're still looked up upon in that way. Um, all of us, we attended Farm Heights High School for the most part, most of us, during segregated days. Um, many of them, of those residents, attended school in DC. Um, though segregation was 
a thing in D.C. as well. They were, I guess, a little more progressive than the, the schools in Maryland here in Prince George's County. We had um, segregated schools in Prince George's County, elementary as well as uh, the high schools. Um, and some of the other schools um, were established by a relationship between the Rosenwald Foundation, which was a foundation of um, Julius Rosenwald, a philanthropist who thought greatly of Frederick Douglass and the Tuskegee, what they call Tus Tuskegee Experiment with um, the Tuskegee Institute teaching the blacks in the South different trades. Um, so as a part of his the, uh, philanthropic interest of um, the Rosenwald Fund, they decided that they would fund um, schools in the different communities that would share the cost of building schools. Um, saying all that to say, Lakeland was one of the schools um, that was a Rosenwald school. Um, Douglas, Frederick Douglass High School, which was in Upper Marlboro, um, was a Rosenwald school. Um, Highland Park was another Rosenwald school. Um, there was a couple other Rosenwald schools. But like I say, those were schools that was built with the assistance of the Rosenwald Foundation and the community. The community would go in half and the Rosenwald Foundation would provide half the schools. Glenarden also had a Rosenwald school. It was a two-room uh, two room school. Most of the Rosenwald schools were one, either one or two-room school. Um, our Glenarden Rosenwald school was in the general area of where the um, St. Joseph Catholic Church was located. Many of the Rosenwald schools were built near railroad tracks because that was an opportunity for them to unload the lumber and structures that was needed to build the Rosenwald schools. So they would build them near uh, railroad tracks. Um, so ours was near the, the BNA, the Baltimore Annapolis Railroad track. Um, but though we had our separate schools then, when Fremont Heights High School was built in 1950, that was an opportunity for all of these communities to come together to attend Fremont Heights High School. Fremont Heights High School was the only high school built for blacks in Prince George's County that went to the 12th grade. The other schools went to the 10th and 11th grade. Um, so all of the blacks in Prince George's County, um, from Akakee to North Brentwood to Bowie to Laurel, so all of the blacks in Prince George's County, was bused to Fremont Heights High School. And that is how we all, for the most part, got together and knew each other. Um, like if um, I see somebody, or somebody bring up a name that I remember, the first thing I'll say, well, where was he from? I would relate that person to the community that they came from, mm -hmm. who attended from a high school. But that was the kind of relationship that we had, just as we would with our recreation. The, the teams, the community, black communities would play one another, uh, baseball and, and football alike. So it was that kind of a relationship between us as blacks in Prince George's County all, all these years, and many of us are maintaining that. We are proud of the fact that um, North Brentwood wanted to build a museum of their history. So they talked with um, Senator Barbara Mikulski and Senator Paul, Paul Sarbanes about funding a library I mean, a uh, museum for North Brentwood. Well, they convinced North Brentwood that they would provide millions of dollars for them to build a museum for 
African Americans in Prince George's County, not just North Brentwood. And that is what we have there now. The, after the Prince George's County, the Prince George's African American Museum and Culture Center okay. in North Brentwood. So we have that there, hopefully to um, um, enlighten people about our history in Prince George's County. Uh, we are finding that there's not that many people that know very much about our history. Because as the saying goes, history is considered his story, mm -hmm. which has not been including black folks. So we have found a need to tell our own story. And I think this is a, what we're doing here is a great opportunity to do just that, just as the uh, um, Prince George's African American Museum and Culture Center in North Brentwood is doing. Um, and there are so many of us that we feel that um, maybe history is not being taught in our schools um, because it seems as if many of the youngsters are not aware of their history. Um, so we use these things as an opportunity to to teach the younger people. And we have noticed that um, as the generations has, have gone on, um, the younger people have now in charge of, as the, the director of the uh, Prince George's African American Museum and Culture Center, that they are relating to the younger generation um, in, in different ways. Uh, from time to time, I'm seeing on uh, WETA um, television station, they are showing some of the um, history of D.C. during the segregated days and during different historical periods. So there are opportunities that are being made to talk about and show our history for everybody to have some greater appreciation for. Mm -hmm. I've gotten to the point of coining a phrase, and that is African Americans' life, liberty, and pursuit of happiness has been minimized and marginalized. In other words, people don't think very much about history because we don't show very much pride in our own history. Though Prince George is considered the most affluent, predominantly African-American jurisdiction in the country, you would never know that we had anything to do with that. So hopefully this will be a part of uh, trying to bring those kind of, kind of realizations to uh, fruition. We can show some pride in our history. Great, great. Well, I'm glad we had the opportunity to talk with you and that you were um, open to sharing that history with us and that information with us. And just to um, close out the interview, I want to ask, um, what type of changes would you like to see for the city of Glen Arden in, in its future? Or, or what do you, you know, envision or know that's coming um, soon for the future of the city? I'd just like for us to continue to grow and show some sense of pride from whence we came so that our youngsters can have the same sense of pride as well and for it to continue to grow and allow Glen Arden to grow. Um, Glen Arden is thought of as, um, well, the way that Glen Arden has grown and the way that Prince George's County has grown, Largo has come very close to our border. And some of the people in Upper Marlboro is saying that Largo is now downtown Prince George's County. But if you look on the other side of 704, that's where Glen Arden is. And that's where you see much of the development in Glen Arden. So I would go so far to say that Glen Arden is considered downtown Prince George's County. So we looked upon, I think, in that way um, as a metropolis even. Okay. I recently heard someone make a reference to that about uh, with some of the development that's occurring in Largo with the hospital and Largo will become the downtown and I you know I'm not from here so I didn't understand you know why they were making that reference but that helps because okay yeah because of the, the Glen Arden the way that we have grown the way that look, we are looked upon by not just the county but the state as well we're looked highly upon um, as a progressive community of which we are I just wish we'd show some sense of pride about it all, that's all. Mm, yeah. Rather than allow it to be, well, okay, oh well. So just show some sense of pride and the fact that we help make Prince Charles County what it is. And it is predominantly African-American jurisdiction. 
and we're the largest and the most affluent. Glen Arden. Glen Arden is. Okay. Exactly. Okay. Well, um, Mr. Winston, I appreciate you taking the time this evening to uh, talk with us and give us give us um, history of the county. You have something else you want to talk yes, about? Yes, yes. Uh, I had a, a panel made that basically showed um, Glen Arden's historical legacy, which shows the many things that Mayor Cousins was involved in. He had um, great um, heights. His vision took us. I have a picture of uh, Mayor Cousins with uh, Vice President Humphrey, oh, Vice wow. President of the United States, um, Maryland Governor McKeldin, which shows that uh, they, back then, had some um, interest in Glen Arden and our growth and development. Um, whenever there's any activities that any of the black communities had, we would invite the uh, mayor and council of those communities to um, celebrate with us and have a picture there of Governor McKeldin at one of our events with many of the other black mayors and council members around, around the county. Uh, another picture of uh, Governor McKeldin in uh, uh, a Cadillac in a parade driving through Glen Arden with mm -hmm. Mayor Cousins. Um, and also a newspaper article about uh, Glen Arden in its days when it was um, dirt roads. It had a parade of uh, the American Legion marching up on Glen Arden Parkway and a picture of uh, Mayor Swan and Mayor Cousins together. So these are just the, the kinds of things that uh, we're so proud of and I wanted to uh, find some way to uh, have it uh, pictured. Um, one of the other pictures that I have here, and that's a picture of uh, Mayor Cousins with his son, Councilman Cousins, and his wife and his grandson, and um, the artist who painted the portrait of, of Mayor Cousins. Oh. Um, and that was um, all a part of the, the Prince George's County Hall of Fame. Mayor Cousins was uh, recognized as a Hall of Fame um, inductee. And that happened because we were successful in um, having um, U.S. Congressman Stenio Hoyer, as well as Congresswoman Donna Edwards, to um, to back that nomination. But he is not the first um, inductee into the Hall of Fame from Glen Arden. We also have um, Teresa Banks, who was um, from Glen Arden. She was a teacher, and she was um, one of the early civil rights activists fighting for uh, the rights of uh, the teachers to get fair pay, uh, to get paid the same as the, the, the white teachers in Prince George's County. Hmm. Um, we also have another black female from Glen Arden in the name of Bonnie Johns. She was well respected as well as a civil rights activist, uh, so much so that they named the school after her. Um, and currently it is now being used as the Prince George's County um, Visionary Arts, where they, um, all of their um, cameras and visionary activities take place there um, at the Bonnie, Bonnie Johns uh, facility. But Bonnie Johns was the wife of um, a black architect, oh. the black architect who designed this very building, the Glen Arden Library as well as the Fairmont Heights Library. So he was a well-known black architect who, um, um, who built quite a few things in the area. That was just kind of an aside. Okay, but I, when you mentioned the architect, I was like, okay, I saw that name in some of the things I was reading. Okay. Right. That goes to show you the kind of people who came in and out of Glen Arden mm -hmm. and through Glen Arden and why Glen Arden has such a reputation as well family friendly, inviting, all those things. So we just want to continue that legacy. Okay. And kind of a commitment to the community, the ever expanding community as far as that goes. Mm -hmm. Because as you can see, we are now, we were um, with Albert Wynn in the, US, in the US House of Representatives. So we go, we go that far. Okay, great, great. Well, again, I thank you for um, giving us this history lesson about the city of Glen Arden, and we look forward to um, talking with you again as we further this project.
and um, we'll be in touch with you. Thank you. Very good. Thank you.